Praise the Lord. Let us repeat. I'm not even going to come behind that whole comedic act that y'all did. Did y'all see what I deal with on a daily basis? Anyhow, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. This book calls me an overcomer. And that's who I am. Today I shall be taught the infallible, unchanging word of God. So my mind is alert. My heart is receptive as I gladly receive the word today. I believe that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're such a good, good Father. We thank you for the opportunity to have a seat with you in heavenly places, and we have a seat at your table. We thank you, God, and we ask now that you would continue to teach us and lead us and guide us through your powerful spoken word. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm all in. That's the title. I'm all in. We're going to read the account of the feeding of the 5,000, but I want to read Jesus' statement before he fed them from Mark 6, and then we're going to read about the feeding itself from John 6, and then we'll go back to Mark 6 to see what happened after the feeding. This story is in all four Gospels. Mark 6, verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Sheep need a shepherd. If you do research on sheep, you'll find out why they need a shepherd. Briefly, I'll just say they cannot protect themselves. They are not hunters nor predators. They cannot feed themselves. They are directionless, prone to wander, even in an absolutely perfect environment. They are defenseless. They're not fighters. Left to themselves, they will not survive very long. Put them in the wild, and you've given nature a snack. They can't fight. They don't have claws or fangs or quills. They can't take flight because they can't run or fly. And their posture wouldn't ward off anything, like a dog's bark or a lion's roar. He said, these people here are like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began to teach them many things because when Jesus sees a problem, he goes into action. So John 6, starting at verse 5. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test them for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. And now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, 
Gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is come into the world. Let's go back to Mark 6, starting at verse 47. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea. This is the same day. And he was alone on the land. And then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled, for they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was hardened. In other words, on the same day, they had forgotten that miracle. They did not consider the miracle that had just happened, that they witnessed how soon we forget. Here's the question. What would have happened to the boys' lunch if the disciples had started distributing it without giving it to Jesus first? Would it have multiplied? Would one lunch consisting of two fish and five loaves feed 5,000 plus people? It would have been shared with someone else besides the boy, but how many people would have benefited? Very few. Some Christians feel that as long as I'm sharing what I have with somebody in need, I'm doing the work of the Lord. But what happens to the distribution if it isn't given to the Lord first? Are we saying to God, I have a better plan? Are we saying to God, I know of needs that you, Lord, know not of? Of course, we can share, but only with what we have left over because they're to get the crumbs from the master's table. But it needs to go to Jesus first and let him do the distribution and it will multiply beyond our imagination. The Bible says Jesus had compassion he said, it says that he fed all of them. And if we want kingdom multiplication, we have to trust the stewardship of the Lord with our seed. 5,000 plus people would not have eaten on that hillside that day had Jesus not received the offering. I'm all in. We have to stop doing what we are capable of doing and give what we have, no matter how small, let him touch it, let him handle it, let him pray over it, and let him multiply it. He is the only miracle worker. Why would we attempt to share a few dollars with people around us when God owns the universe and multiplies our resources to reach further than we could ever ask or think. Yeah, yeah. We want some corner of this world of which we can say to God, mine, but there is no such corner. I'm sure you've heard the expression, don't put all your eggs in one basket. This is a piece of advice 
which means that one should not concentrate all efforts and resources in one area because you could lose all of it if you depend on just that one basket for your success. And it came from the scenario where the farmer would gather his eggs from the hen house and put everything into one basket. But if he would fall or drop the basket, then you would lose all of your eggs. This is good advice in some places. If you're applying for a new job, you probably need to apply in more than one place and see where you might land. If you need some plumbing work done at your house, you might want to get more than one estimate. If you invest in, in the stock, you don't want to invest in just one because it might fail. They say it's better to diversify. But in the kingdom of God, it is expected that you put all your eggs in one basket, in the kingdom basket. My mother used to teach me, don't put all your eggs in one basket, but it was in certain cases. And this cannot apply to the kingdom. I'm all in. I have taught for many years that for young people to go to school, put all of your concentration in those few years, and trust me, it's just a few years. And after you get that diploma and degree in your hand, after putting in those few years, that intense investment, then you have the rest of your life to enjoy the benefits of those few intense years. Spouses, husbands and wives, need to put all your eggs into one basket as it pertains to that marriage. Not to say that you don't have outside interests or hobbies or whatever, but that in that marriage, I commit to the commands of scripture. I will love and honor all the days of my life. I will put all my spousal eggs in one marriage basket and not diversify. <laughs> I heard a story not long ago. Uh, a mayor took his wife to lunch one day. And as they were sitting at the table eating, in walks this obviously homeless man. He was dressed in rags, he wasn't well groomed, and he was begging. So the mayor looks at the man and says to his wife, isn't that your ex-boyfriend? And the wife looks at him real good and she says, yes, that's him. The mayor says, aren't you glad you didn't marry him? The wife says, no, because if I had married him, he would be the mayor. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. I knew I would get applause from the ladies. Because she put all her eggs in his basket. <laughs> let's give a look. I'm all in. Amen. So let's talk about the kingdom basket. People are added to the body. When people decide to accept Jesus, then he adds you to the body, the local church, the baptized, the spirit-filled, visible body of Christ. By church membership, we are joined to the blood-bought community of Jesus. Your physical body is not a casual, random collection of unrelated and loosely related parts. So if the physical body has identifiable members, so does the local church. And then God places us as he so chooses. I'm all in. The Bible talks about our treasure. Matthew 6, 
verses 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The old people used to call it sending up my timber. Every hand of violence will be aimed at the house where the treasure is laid up. And so it can be taken from us. I've had three cars stolen, my house vandalized, my purse snatched right after I cashed my check, my debit card compromised three times. These are coming for you all the time, but they can't touch my timber. Where the treasure is, there the value and esteem are, there the love and affection are, that's where the desires and the pursuits go. Look at your checkbook, your debit card statement, your credit card statement, and you will see what it is that you treasure. Follow your trail of time, your affection, your energy, your money. And at the end of that trail, you'll find a throne. Even our service to God and the reward of them, if it's done only to gain the applause of men, is treasure on earth, not heaven. I'm all in. Let's go to Acts 4 starting at verse 32, and it's going to flow right into Acts 5. I don't know why they broke this up into two chapters, but they did. Acts 4, 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. This is talking about the beginning of the church in the book of Acts. Neither did any one believer say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Jose, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Chapter 5. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife, also being aware of it, let me put a pause right here. I know people say, well, that's, that's my husband. That's my wife. But if you're in the wrong with them, you're going down with them. Okay. <laughs> but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived you got to conceive this thing. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So fear came, of course, upon all those who heard these things. 
Let me say that the reason he immediately died is a whole nother message that explains this new dispensation of the spirits in filling. Today, it is not common for people to drop dead for not giving of their treasure or for lying to the Holy Spirit, because otherwise all of us would be in trouble. <laughs> so people not dropping dead, y'all. However, the Holy Spirit today does know your heart. Ananias is seeing all of the generous giving of the other believers as they're led by the Holy Spirit. So he and his wife decide we want to give too. They pretended to be so moved by the Holy Spirit, except when it was their turn, the Holy Spirit told Peter, Ananias is lying. Ananias lied to me. I need you to know this as he approaches you. He lied to me. We have seen church services. We've been in church services where they call for the $500 line. They call for the $100 line. And you would be surprised how many people get in that line with an empty envelope. because they're so moved to fulfill this request and to make a show because nobody's going to know and they don't even put their name on it. So when they collect it, we've seen it happen. When they collect it in the back, you get envelope empty, no name, envelope empty, no name. Well, this was the $500 basket. This was the hundred dollar basket. How, how that happened? Because you're lying to the Holy Spirit. The people around you, they don't know. They're like, "Ooh, girl, you got five hundred dollars." Ooh. <laughs> so you got your applause for doing absolutely nothing. So because they pretended like they were on board with this request. That's why it happened to them. They wanted to either be seen or they wanted the applause of man. And that's what Ananias did. So the Holy Spirit told Peter that Ananias was lying and that his treasure was back home. Satan is a lying spirit, but Ananias conceived it because Satan can't make you do anything. They could have sold their land and kept all the profits. But instead, they lied about how much money that they made. And because they wanted to keep part, they just could have kept it all. Or they could have said, we sold it for such and such, but we really need half of it, so we're going to keep it. Just be honest. I ain't giving you all my money. Be honest and he would have lived. Because Peter said, was it not your own in the first place? When it was sold, it was yours. But once it's vowed, it's not yours any longer. And the same principle applies to our heart. When we give it to God, it's not to be divided as we see fit. And so Peter talks to Ananias, and he fell dead before he had time to repent. So where is the treasure now? I'm all in. Yeah. Yeah. Pastors have one of the most difficult jobs ever. Teachers and pastors are so undervalued. Teachers especially because every profession in the world is obtained by being taught by a teacher. Doctors are taught, pharmacists are taught, plumbers are taught, and teachers are undervalued and tremendously underpaid. Compared to what a, a, a sports athlete makes who's entertaining us, but yet the teacher who was his coach in high school is barely making ends meet. 
Pastors, on the other hand, must manage a ministry based on volunteers. They must manage a budget with voluntary donations. It's a hard thing. Pastors must confront people's sin in a loving and grace-filled way. Pastors must cast and implement vision. Pastors must counsel people through all types of trauma. Pastors must visit the hospitalized, even those who didn't say they were in the hospital. Pastors must study and apply scripture to today's culture in a relevant manner without compromising mission or truth. Pastors must, must challenge you people, sheep, through preaching while being compared to the greatest preachers and teachers in the world yeah. that don't have to pastor you. Yeah. <laughs> I follow preachers on TV and online, and I have benefited greatly from their teaching, but when their ads come on at the end and the credits roll, they're done with you. They're not your pastor. Pastors must, must lead and mentor an ever-developing staff of all ages and personalities, just to name a few things. We baptize, bury, wed, dedicate babies, rub elbows, attend birthday parties, showers, graduations, ball games. <laughs> Don't dare get invited and not show up. Yeah. 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 We see them after they prom, don't we, Bethany? Yeah. And with all that, we worship. We still love what we do because we know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord, and our treasure is in ministry. I'm all in. I will tell you why you need to say I'm all in. Let's start with the fact that you have Jesus as Lord and the Holy Spirit as a companion forever. The Bible paints a perfect picture of a perfect father. Jesus came to show us what God is really like and to show us prodigals how to get home. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. I can't comprehend where the world turns to in times of trouble and chaos and struggle and issue. We have a friend above friends who calls us friend. Look at how good the father is. There have been so many things that we thought we could not live without. How could you live without this person? How could you live without this job? How could you live without this relationship? How could you live without this house? How could you live without all the things that we think are so important? or death came to someone that you loved, or you lost the job, or you messed up that that timing, or felt like somebody had messed you up. You were filled with heartache and gut-wrenching anguish, and you thought you would really die. Because you love this person, or this life, or this job that you built, because your bow broke, you cried out with everything you had. While the sails were ripping and the board splitting, you heard the sound of your spirit dying. The life you had was over. But to your own surprise, you were not over, as much as you may have wanted to be. And there's a reason. You didn't die. 
you walked away from the accident. Whether or not you think you or God or the devil or the fates are somehow uh, to be blamed for this, you just knew you would die, but you didn't. You're still here. There's a reason. Can you remember the first time after that, that tragic thing happened, after you could not bear to eat or drink, that the hunger pains came anyhow? Did you feel mistrustful at yourself, at the animal part of you that still wanted food after such a terrible thing? Did wanting to eat bring guilt as if you weren't worthy? Fog, sorrow, grief, loss may have altered your taste buds, but it hardly killed them. There's a reason. This is still a part of, there is still a part of you that yearns for something outside yourself. You're, you felt uh, yourself out to sea, and yet some kind of desire for something or another bears you along, and you find yourself still somehow here amongst, against your own wishes. And even in the moments when anything that felt like conscious desire went out with the tie, there is still some kind of near morbid curiosity of your life to find out how it's going to turn out. There's a reason. Somewhere between your body's animal refusal to go down quietly, your mind's refusal to stop imagining, and your heart's refusal to stop dreaming, to birth something new in the tangled mess of memories and impulses, there lies God. Yes, yes. He's lurking in your broken spirit. And here's the reason. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure. in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Yes. We are hard pressed on every side, yes. yet not crushed. Yes. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. There's a reason. Yes. You have God's fingerprint yes. to create, to love, yes. to live, to give of yourself when there is no self left to give. You can still stand flat footed and say, I'm all in. Yes. You were created in the image of God, and before you knew anyone or did anything, everything in you was in you necessary to live as that image of God within you, that part of you that knows what it is to be perfectly loved, perfectly held, perfectly known. It is still very much there. There's a part of you that does not need anything else or anyone else in particular to be alive. There's a part of you that knows this, part of you that has always known this, but has long since forgotten. The God who sustains also created, all the created things is a God who continually loves. And so in you is the capacity to love and to live without needing the world to work out a certain way in order for you to be okay. Yeah. Your life, your existence, is contingent upon the Holy Spirit, not anyone else or anything else. God creates, God sustains, and God resurrects. Yeah. Believing this won't mean that you still won't feel the weight of deep, dark, piercing grief, or that you should feel guilty when you do. But at least you know where to turn. Our Father is our uncontested priority 
every egg in one basket, yeah. all your weight on one limb. Yeah. This very moment he has his fingers gripped on your chin saying, look right here. Don't look to the right, don't look to the left. Look right here. I got you. I'm him. I am the deliverer. And God will deliver you or he will be nothing at all. You need to be a world changer. And world changers are not cheap. They're not tight. They're not stingy. They're not lazy. And they're certainly not a bystander. That's a world changer. They're hall of famers. They're leaders and champions. You have to say I'm all in because God is all in. He gave his all. And this is something I say a lot. I'm sure you've heard me say God. uh, All is one of God's favorite words. And he uses it all the time. The Bible says he put all things under his feet. The Bible says and they were all filled. The Bible says and he healed them all. The Bible says if any man be in Christ he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold all things become new. The Bible says For all the promises of God are yes and amen. The Bible says he works all things according to the counsel of his will. The Bible says he is far above all principality and power and might and everything that is named. The Bible says he shall supply all your need according not to your riches, not to your treasure, not to your resources, but according to his riches. The Bible says he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The Bible says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible says he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, instruction. The Bible says all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. When he was resurrected, he said, I got all authority. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then the Bible talks about us as it relates to all. The Bible says, having done all to stand. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ. The Bible says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. The Bible says, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. The Bible says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Bible says to love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. The Bible says he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. This list is not exhaustive, but this last one I'm going to give you is one of my favorites. It's 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8 through 10. And God is able... to make all grace abound toward you. That you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. I'm all in. That ought to make you say I'm all in. Where else can you turn? Where else can you go? Don't follow what the world is doing because they're dying. 
And we need to be saving them with all, with all that we have. I'm coming to a close. Day 39. In the book, Drawing the Circle, I have some more copies downstairs. For those of you that do have them caught up with day 39, you might want to just skip to that one. It talks about Ken Gobb, a Christian author. Ken was traveling with his family on I-75 near Dayton, Ohio. And they decided to stop at a restaurant. And his family went inside while he stayed out to stretch his legs. And he passed by a phone booth and the phone, a pay phone, and the phone was ringing. Thinking it might be an emergency, he picked it up. And to his surprise, the operator asked for him by name. He thought he was on candy camera. After acknowledging that he was Ken, a woman named Millie says to him, she's from uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. You don't know me, but I need your help. She had just written a suicide note, but decided to give prayer one more try. She remembers seeing Ken on TV and thought if I could just talk to him, he could help me. So as she prayed, some numbers popped into her head and she wrote them down. She thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if God was giving me Ken's phone number? So she tried the number and the operator, the operator said, it's you, Ken. Millie asked Ken, are you in your office? Ken said, no. Then where are you? I'm in a phone booth in Dayton, Ohio. What are you doing there? He says, I'm answering the payphone. Ken thought, what were the astronomical odds that with millions of phones and innumerable combination of numbers, only in all knowing God could have caused Millie to call that number in that phone booth at that moment while Ken was walking by. Afterwards, Ken went in the restaurant and he told his wife, he said, you won't believe this, but God knows where I am. I believe this story because I have been in a place, and I know some of you have too, where no one knew me, knew my name, or knew my story. And God demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was present and that he knew I was there. He manifested himself in an undeniable manner that I had to acknowledge his awesomeness. As Christians, you are entitled to those moments. Through prayer, through seeking God, he will let you know I'm right in the midst and I know where you're at. I'm all in. If you haven't been convinced already, hopefully you've been convinced today that you need to be all in with a God who can find you off the highway in a random restaurant and a random payphone to say, I know where you are. Yes. Blessings to you. Hallelujah. How many of you all in today, really? You, you don't know what you just said yes to. 
How many of you all in what you're giving? How many of you all in with your service? How many of you all in with your worship? Hallelujah. that you may not like that I'm going to say. You can't be all in when you're hearing a message if you're on your phone. And I just wish for a day when somebody would develop a device that when you come into sacred settings that we could turn them off. Not trust you to turn them off. They would just go off. Because you cannot get it if you're not listening. And if you're distracted. The only way God can talk to you is if he's got your attention. But we're so newsworthy until we got to know what's going on till we're doing this and saying, uh-huh, amen, but we're not listening. Because I dare say there's some of you I could ask, what was the story about that she just told and you couldn't tell me the story? That's what mean all in is about. But this is one of the things that pastors notice and pastors watch because I'm watching the sheep. I'm watching people. Maybe what you're hearing would stop an emergency that's going to happen later. So I plead with you when you come in this house, listen. That ain't important. No, no, no. Listen. I don't care what it is. Even if we're taping it, you don't need to watch it while we're doing it. Are you understanding? Does that make sense? And it's time for you, if you're a part of this house, that you all in. We don't need hit or miss members that come in and say, I'm a part of Dove, but you show up every so often. I'm a part of Dove, but I don't tithe into the house. I don't give. And you'd be offended if I went from person to person and asked you, why don't you give? And you can't tell me I don't have the resources. Why don't you give? the gist of everything she said is that by the time they got the fishes and the loaves earlier in the day by this that evening they had totally forgotten about what God had done for them and that's how quick we forget and some of you say I can't afford to give well quit your job then it'll be true your job and it'll be true tell them don't send your social security check tell them don't pay your pension it'll be true does that make sense that's what it's about and I guess that's one of those things that pastors correct and do and you know that But, 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 but it's the will of the Father and sometimes we don't like to hear the will of the Father. Because while Jesus laughed and played with the disciples, he's the same one that turned around and said, 
depart from me, uh, uh, Satan. He's still the same one that will challenge them in the innermost part. But he's also the same one that on that Friday would let them to a cross and would die for them. That's what love is all about. And if we let you stay the same and if we never challenge you to be different, then you'll say, nobody ever told me. And, 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 and if that's a, that would be a tragedy if nobody ever told you. But you can't say nobody ever told you. Because we want you to live abundantly, live free and live full and live everything. you got to be all in. And to be all in, you can't straddle the world and be in the church. You cannot do it. I know you can't do it. There's no diversification. Your ba- it's got to be in one basket, in the kingdom basket. That's what she said. How many know that's right? It's got to be in the kingdom basket. Turn to somebody and say, I heard her when she said, I'm all in. If you heard the story, say, I heard the story at the end of the message. And I can repeat it. Does that make sense? How many you can say, at one point in my life, I was this way about something. But I heard some teaching that challenged me about my this way about something. And I started being a different way about it. And because I made a decision about the newness that I heard, I forsook the old stuff that, that, that I thought was okay and went into the new stuff. And I'm different because I made a decision that day about the new stuff and I'm not the change. I mean, you know you better because of the decision you made. Because some challenged you. Oh my God. My God. I, I just couldn't pass that opportunity up. And every one of us has been there. Turn to somebody again and say, I'm all in. Come on, Dove. Turn to somebody and say, I'm all in. You know who you're talking about? It's us. It's just us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we celebrate, we celebrate together. When we worship, we worship together. When we do outside activities, we do it together because we love this house. And then she read the scripture how they had all things common among them. Because they realize we're all in. It's about us. There's some of you I know and I can trust that if you got some, some amazing resources that, 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 that you will cancel the lack in many folks' lives. You, you would do that. And you would do it because you have a scriptural example. This is what the Bible says do. But if I could just get us to do what the Bible says do, not what we think about it. No, I'll, I'll do this, I'll do that. You're, like she said, you're telling God, you don't know your business because I'm, I'm doing this because you don't know your business. But he knows. So I'm challenging us all over this room to rededicate ourselves to saying, Pastor, I'm going to be all in. And I don't want you to do it unless you, you're ready to say, I'm, I'm all in, Pastor. I'm, I'm, this, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. And the vision will move in such an a, 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 a exponential way. You would be just amazed. You would say, oh, Lord, what happened? Well, well they, 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 they became one. If that's you, for real. If that's you, for real. 
put up your hand and say, I'm rededicating myself to this. I'm rededicating myself to this. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to make you a promise and not keep it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to function. Lord, bless them today. You're the God of the second and the third chance. And you give us an opportunity to reconnect and to remake it right. And that's right. If you can't make the commitment, leave your hand down. But if you can make a commitment and say, I'm in. I'm going to do this. I, I determined to do what God wants me to do. I I'm going to do that thing. And I'm taking a visual picture today because I want to remember. I want to know that the people of this house are all in and that they're, they're, they're subscribing to it. They're saying, this is what we're going to do because we want to see things move in a different way. That's why this message came. It, it, it wasn't just to inform us, it was to push us. How many received that push? Now reach over and push somebody else. Push. Just push them. Say, so did you get the push today? Or were you on your phone? Did you get the push or were you on your phone? I'm glad we're not dropping dead today. Anybody glad we're not dropping dead? Aren't you glad the Holy Spirit didn't tell me their treasure is at home? They're telling a lie. God won't expose us because all we have to do is do it ourselves. Take somebody by the hand. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this rededication. We thank you for the word of our pastor. We thank you, God. Hallelujah. We thank you for the word all. And, and, and today we declare it together. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Come on, come on, say it again. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now give the Lord a big hand clap for prayer. He's working all things. Come on, you can do better than that. Give God a good prayer. I'm not trying to just make anybody else look bad. I just, you can sit down. I, I, I just want to thank, thank, thank Annie. And I've known her through periods of her life when, when she was feeling different and feeling better. But she makes it her point to get here every Sunday. And Annie had a serious illness and she, I think she had a stroke and and she determined, I, I, I'm going to do some things. Somebody else had her car. She said, I'm going to drive my car again. And not only did she do that, she said, I'm going to buy me another car. Then I'm going to drive my car again. I can do all things. You're without excuses today. I, I can do most things. I can do 90% of the things. What is it that hinders you today? Stop telling yourself I can't do it. Put your hand on yourself. I, I'm, I can do it. And I'm going to do it. Jan, all things. I'm looking at you. You didn't think it was possible, and you're doing it. I'm looking at you, Katina. You didn't think it was possible, but you're doing it. Hallelujah. Shirley, you're more active now than you were in your working years. And God, about to run us to death, because God, I can do all things. Oh, I ain't retiring. Pastor Barbara say we refiring in Jesus' name. You get tired, you sit down. 
You rest. You stay asleep. I'm up and on the move. I don't have time to sleep. I can look at each and every one of you and I know where God is, bro. <laughs> You've been denied. Somebody told you no. Somebody didn't like you. But you're still moving in it. Oh, God. Some of you still in the hallway, but that's all right. You're looking at the door now. How many of you in the hallway looking at the door now? And you're not looking at the door now behind you. You're looking at the next one. Come on, give God a praise. <laughs> Even when I don't. I mean, really know he a way maker for real. He, you're not playing with that thing. You, you ain't trusting you because you know you ran out. And you're running out. I'm looking at some senior citizens that buying, still buying houses. Because one thing about all, one all leads to another. It leads to another. And once you connect it to the all stream, all begets all. All has all babies. Because all has an end point. Because the Bible says another all. God is. My all. <laughs> Lord, I still believe it. You are working. When I cannot see it. Stand and sing that, Jarrell. I can't see it. I can't see it. You are working. You are working all things for. I dare you to say that. is your faithfulness. Don't look down. Look up. It's going to work out. You're going to take your own path. The path don't have to be like anybody else's. You don't have to mimic them. You don't have to do none of that. It's going to be your path and it's going to be all right and you're going to look back and the Lord's going to do it your way. You don't have to compare yourself to not another person because he made you unique and wonderful just like you are. Do you receive that? Day? Come here. Come here. Come here. Take it off of her head, God. No, 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 no. You're not lacking nothing. Ah, da, 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 ba, 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 ba. Hallelujah. I watched it in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. And you're going to look back and you're going to remember the day that the Lord spoke to you this way. Oh, don't come back. Oh, no, 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 no,